so good evening everyone present here this is our 28th online teaching class under the banner of upri uh, this is the 11th class under a press concentration which is very important class especially for our md student that is the radio therapy planning from 2d to 3d and further high technology so to start with this i would like to invite dr ashutosh mukherjee he is the head of the department of professor uh, radiation oncology mpmmcc and hpcs tmc varanasi dr ashutosh can you start please thank you uh, dr surbi so i would like to introduce the speaker for tonight um, dr prashant giridhar assistant professor in radiation oncology at uh, tata memorial hospital varanasi and uh, he has done his uh, mbbs from jipmer and his md from aims he has also done an icmr fellowship at aims and now he has joined us as assistant professor he will be talking on very specifically radiotherapy planning in cases of large operable breast cancers as well as locally advanced breast cancers i uh, invite now dr prashant to kindly start the uh, the lecture today uh, good evening all uh, today's topic is uh, radiotherapy planning in large operable breast cancer and locally advanced breast cancer uh, this topic is easier to explain if it is a practical uh, case scenario with a patient and a simulator if possible but i'll do my best uh, to explain it as uh, simple simple as possible so uh, learning objectives of the lecture uh, first one is to revise the indications of radiation Uh, in locally advanced breast cancer and large operable breast cancer then learn the process of 2d planning which i'll be explaining in detail and then learn the process of 3d or imrt planning which is uh, important for uh, physicians so this is the summary of indications of breast radiotherapy uh, so if a patient has uh, i mean breast radiation would be required in all patients who have undergone uh, breast conservation surgery chest wall radiation is indicated if there is a pathological t3 and t4 disease and a node positive disease uh, margin is positive if re surgery is not possible and if nct is given clinical t3 uh, or higher or n1 or higher the indications for supraclavicular radiation uh, would include clinical n2 or n3 disease if nct is received more than four positive lymph nodes uh, after axillary dissection one to three lymph nodes with high risk features now these high risk features uh, vary from institute to institute uh, in general the high risk features include age less than 40 years uh, lvsi being positive and triple negative breast cancer and in rare cases where there is a positive sentinel lymph node with no axillary lymph node dissection been done and no dissection at all uh, has been done after a re surgery opinion has been sought uh, dr prashant could you maximize your screen sorry could you maximize your screen sorry uh, uh, is it still in the uh, this thing sir uh, yeah yeah okay so it is already maximized okay then please continue please continue okay so the indications for axillary uh, radiation includes uh, if there is extensive extra capsular extension and sentinel lymph node was positive again no dissection was done or an inadequate axillary dissection was done uh, now uh, radiation for internal mammary lymph nodes again it changes from institute to institute we have some data to suggest that positive axillary lymph node uh, with central and medial lesions and uh, uh, sentinel lymph node positive or imaging positive in internal mammary chain if these features are present radiation to this uh, group of lymph nodes could improve the disease free survival so this is just in short the indications for breast radiotherapy just to start our class so that we uh, have the context for the class so we'll start with an example of a large operable breast cancer these are typical uh, patients that we see in our opts so we have uh, for an example a 50 year old female premenopausal who presented with a 4 into 3 cm lump in right uh, breast upper outer quadrant clinically no axillary lymph nodes were present core biopsy showed an infiltrating ductal carcinoma with common status being positive and her uh, equivocal and no metastasis now this patient can undergo bcs can undergo an mrm uh, patient because there is no axillary lymph nodes slnd versus alnd so for the uh, initial phase or initial part of our uh, lecture we'll assume that this patient has undergone a breast conservation surgery and an alnd has been done 
Now, this patient would require both chemo as well as radiation. Local radiation, uh, whole breast RT is to be given if PCS is done uh, because the size of tumor is a bit, bit large, APBI is out of the picture. And then based on our uh, lymph node status, we'll decide for regional radiation. We'll come to that part later. So treatment planning. So we start with treatment planning for whole breast radiation and chest wall radiation. So the aim of treatment planning is adequate tumor coverage with a uniform dose distribution throughout the target volume with minimum dose to surrounding normal tissues. So the basic steps in planning includes positioning and immobilization, uh, simulation, then uh, you, know, you define the target volume, then you define the dose and fractionation, and then you verify the setup. So treatment position. The most important aspect of position is patient comfort and reproducibility. So for breast cancer, whole breast radiation and chest wall uh, planning, uh, you have mostly the supine position, but in large breasts, you can also use the prone position. So for positioning and immobilization in breast radiotherapy, you usually use these three, uh, uh, three things. One is the breast board. We have a supine breast board and then we have a prone breast board. And then if the patient is going to be planned with conformal radiation, we may utilize a vac lock or a breast uh, or a blue bag. So breast board, what is it? So in the next few slides, we'll see what's a breast board, what are the uses of a breast board, and then what are the uses of a prone breast board. So, So yeah, so this picture actually shows a typical breast board. Now different uh, vendors have slight modification to the breast board, but basically a breast board has an inclined plane. Uh, it has a flat surface and a wedge, and then you have a headrest, and then you have arm supports and wrist supports. So these are the general parts of the breast board. The inclination has usually various angles from 10 degrees to 20 degrees, depending on requirement. And the present, this wedge is basically to prevent the patient from moving downwards. So basically the patient was uh, kept in this position, the headrest position is fixed, uh, the arm and the wrist positions are fixed based on how much uh, arm abduction is possible for the patient and uh, the wedge prevents the patient from moving downwards. So breast board is a simple positioning as well as an immobilization device in breast radiotherapy. So what are the advantages of a breast board? So there are several adjustable parts to allow manipulation for patient's arms, wrist, head, and elevation. Uh, it makes the chest surface uh, horizontal. Uh, the next one is that it takes the arms out of the way of tangential beams. And this breast board can also be added with certain other supports like a thermoplastic breast support. And it is usually made up of carbon fiber and therefore it has lower attenuation levels. Now, uh, we have to note most importantly this point, that is it makes the chest wall surface horizontal. So we need to know with respect to what and what is its use. So if you look at a patient uh, who is lying in supine position in a flat surface, what you have is an oblique anterior chest wall. So the anterior chest wall slopes downwards towards the neck. Now. Uh, if you want to uh, create, if you want to place a field like this, what happens is an excess amount of lung gets irradiated. Now, this you can solve by using collimation. But if you collimate this field, what happens is matching with the supraclavicular field becomes difficult. And this is where the breast board is a simple way to help this out. So, in the breast board, what is done is the chest wall position of the patient is slightly elevated. And then when you, and therefore the chest wall surface becomes almost parallel to the couch. As you can see in this picture, the patient is slightly elevated. Therefore the chest wall field has become slightly parallel to the couch surface. So again, you can see in, uh, in this picture, this is a CT image, a sagittal cut, but uh, for explaining this concept, this has been brought in here. So if you look at it here, there was no chest tilt, that is no breast board. So what has happened is to decrease the dose to the lung, they have done collimation and then they have placed a supraclavicular field. Now, 
to prevent a hot spot what they have done is they moved the supraclavicular field a little more superiorly and therefore there's a cold spot here which is not desirable and therefore if you use a chest tilt then you can use a parallel field and then use a supraclavicular field with no cold spot or hot spot so uh, for pgs the most important point is the breast board uh, it is essential to reduce lung dose as well as to make the process of planning easier in breast plus lymph node radiation Uh, so what we have seen now is the supine breast board. There is another option which is not very commonly available but useful in certain conditions. That is called the prone breast board. Now the prone breast board has certain components in it. Uh, so there is a, a face cushion where the patient lies in the prone position and keeps his keeps her face over uh, the cushion. Then, like the supine breast board, you have got certain uh, certain things to hold uh, your arms and then there is a uh, space here where the, the breast that needs to be treated would be placed and then there is a 15 degree contralateral wedge so the 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 aim of this wedge is to push the bre opposite breast away uh, from the field so here you can see just a CT scan image. So as you can see, there is a small wedge here and then there's a space here where the whole breast is moved in. So this breast, the contralateral breast has been moved to the opposite side. Uh, so as you can see here, once you use the prone breast board, what happens is uh, the lung dose is reduced quite a bit compared to the supine breast board. So, uh, all these things in the prone breast board looks very rosy, but then it is not being very commonly used. So we need to know what are the pros and cons of a prone versus a supine breast board. So a supine breast board, as we can understand, it is easy to set it up. Easy to set it up. It is a tried and tested technique, and therefore the staff in any hospital are familiar with the utilization of it. The most important point is that matching of nodal fields to the chest wall fields is very easy with the supine breast board. The disadvantages, there is some gravity effect uh, with large effects, and therefore uh, skin sparing may be a little less. Uh, immobilization of breast tissue may be difficult. In the prone technique, as we did see, the major advantage is the lung dose can be reduced. The opposite breast dose can also be reduced by pushing it away to the opposite side. But the disadvantage, the most important disadvantage is that it is not possible to match the nodal fields very well. So now we have uh, seen how to place and immobilize a breast cancer patient who is being planned for whole breast or chest wall radiation. So now we'll move on to how you actually place the fields and plan. So we'll start with 2D planning. So again, 2D planning positioning we have seen. Uh, after positioning is the marking of tangential fields. After that, we need to calculate the angle of tangential fields. And then we need to verify the uh, fields with X-ray if available. And then we have to check the CLD, that is the central lung distance, and the MHD, that is the maximum heart distance. And then we look at B modification in whole breast radiation. So positioning, this is what we have done. We have used a breast board. The arm is comfortably placed in an armrest. The wrist support is there. And the position of the head, it can be neutral or it can be turned to the opposite side. Now, if you're using only two tangentials, that is no supraclavicular or axillary radiation required, then the head uh, uh, patient looks straight up. If it is three field, that is you also are going to treat supraclavicular region, then usually the head is turned to the opposite side. So now we come to placing the tangential fields. So uh, first scenario is you have an X-ray simulator in your department, and therefore you can utilize that to plan your uh, uh, plan, uh, plan your uh, fields. So the field borders for tangential fields, the cranial border, it is usually the second intercostal space or head of clavicle, depending on whether you're treating the supraclavicular fossa. The medial border, uh, it is usually at 
or one centimeter away from the midline. Lateral border, two centimeter beyond all palpable breast tissue or the mid axillary line. Uh, lower border is two centimeters below the inframammary fold. Or if it is post MRM, it is two centimeters below the lowest point of the opposite breast. So these borders can be modified to an extent to cover the entire breast tissue and if possible, scars as well. So the main aim is not to miss the target. So this is the first step. You mark out the field borders of tangential fields. Step two, before we place the patient in the X-ray, uh, before we start taking the X-ray simulator image, is to measure this y-axis. So the y-axis usually is around 16 to 20 centimeters, depending on the height of the patient. So 16 to 20 centimeters, and then you open an arbitrary field that is in the x-axis around 12 centimeters or so. Then, how do you decide gantry angles? So now that the fields have been marked, we need to decide the gantry angles. So the first point to note is, even though there are two fields, usually an SSD technique is used for uh, whole breast or chest wall radiation planning. Once uh, the patient has, uh, uh, has been marked these borders, you place a lead wire on the medial and the lateral border. So, so you place a lead wire here and a lead wire in the mid axillary line. Then you open a field with a SSD surface to source distance of 80 centimeters or 100 centimeters, depending on what type of X-ray simulator you have. And the Y field is opened as per marking and the X field is usually between 12 to 14 centimeters. Then after that, the next step is you rotate the gantry such that the posterior border of the field matches with both wires. So here is an example. Uh, the black one and the blue one are say the lead wires that we have uh, stuck on the skin. And this white one is the posterior border of the field. So now, uh, even in this example, there's a 12 centimeter field opened. Uh, you need to rotate the gantry uh, uh, of your fluoroscopy or X-ray simulator till the point that all these three lines meet. That is your posterior field, your uh, medial lead wire and your lateral lead wire. So once you've achieved that on your either your medial field or the lateral field, you mark the gantry angle. Now, when you mark the gantry angle, you also have to check whether your SSD is still 80 or 100 centimeters. There is a possibility that when you rotate the gantry, your SSD at the center over the breast tissue is slightly different. So now you again have to bring that SSD to 80 and uh, mark the field borders again. Now, after the center has been marked, for one of the uh, fields, you do the same process again for the opposite field. So you rotate the gantry to the opposite direction. Again, see whether the uh, both the lead marks are matching and then you mark the center of the field. Now, so you now have two centers of lateral field and medial field marked over the breast tissue. The next step is to measure the depth of prescription. So when you're using whole breast radiation, uh, the depth of prescri uh, prescription is calculated from separation between the centers. So it is half the distance between separation of centers. So uh, um, so it, it, is, it is kind of, if, if the students haven't actually done it on an X-ray simulator, it's difficult to explain it, but... Um, so, but these are the steps that are to be marked on an X-ray simulator. Now, once this image, once this image has been attained, so you have a posterior field, you have the lead wires, which is marked, uh, and you mark the centers. There are certain things that needs to be verified. The first thing is to check whether the entire breast or the chest wall is covered in the portal. So this image is not very clear, but as if you can see here, this is where the field is ending. So the breast tissue is ending in this region. So you need to have at least one to two centimeters clearance because the patient is going to breathe. And therefore, the breast is going to move up and down. And therefore, you need to give some space for your PTV as well as your penumbra for, com for the completion of your field. So first step is you see on the X-ray simulator, that these three are matched and then you see whether the entire breast tissue is covered 
with the margin. The second thing that you see is the distance from the chest wall to your posterior border of the field. So in a 2D planning, up to 2.5 centimeter is quite acceptable. Now we'll see why that is. So these are the two, three things that you would see once an X-ray image of lateral or medial tangential field has been done. So now coming to central lung distance. So the concept of central lung distance, it's easier to see in a CT cut. So the perpendicular distance from the posterior tangential field edge to the posterior part of your anterior chest wall or breast. So that is the central lung distance. Uh, maximum lung distance is another parameter, but it is not usually seen. So what is the significance of central lung distance? Now, central lung distance predicts the percentage of ipsilateral lung volume that is treated. So if your central lung distance is 1.5 centimeters, then 6% of lung is irradiated. And progressively, it goes up to 26% if your CLD, that is this distance, is 3.5 centimeters. That is why we uh, usually choose between 1 and 2.5 centimeters. Now, point is to be noted here is the central lung distance should not be less than 0.5 centimeters. In fact, less than one centimeter in a 2D plan. This is because again, the patient would respire and it is possible that the deeper parts of your breast may be missed if you keep a very low central lung distance as well. So an ideal lung uh, central lung distance is between, sorry. So ideal central lung distance is between one and 2.5. Right, so uh, another point to note is if your central lung distance is less than three centimeters, then the risk of radiation pneumonitis is less than 2%. So that is the catch point. Similarly, in the maximum heart distance, so what you see is, so in an X-ray simulator, you mark out the heart border and you see the distance between the maximum perpendicular distance between the posterior tangential field and the heart border. The maximum heart distance is ideally to be less than one centimeter in a breast radiation plan. Right, so uh, finally, when you do this process, that is you mark the lead wires, you then rotate the gantry, then mark the centers, you will have these two fields. That is two tangential fields, which are parallel to each other. With the, in a 2D planning, you'll have two centers to be marked on the breast here and here. And then your depth of prescription is usually the center. The, so the, the planning that I explained to you has already circumvented this problem of divergence of beams because we are rotating the X-ray simulator to an angle such that all three uh, wires are seen parallel to each other. Now there is another way by which you can circumvent this. That is by using a half beam block. When you use a half beam block, your center of the beam, instead of lying on the breast tissue, would lie on your lateral and medial border. And therefore, the central axis of the beam is actually going as a tangent, and the rest is blocked, blocked with a half beam block if it is available. Now, uh, in centers where you do not have half beam blocks with independent jaws, a breast cone can also do this job. Right, so now we have seen uh, places where X-ray simulator is available, but there may be centers where X-ray simulator is not available. Now, in that case, how do you plan it? So then you, uh, you, you place plaster of Paris across the patient's breast or chest wall. Then you take it out in this manner. You place it on a flat sheet and uh, you identify the angle from this diagram, as you can see here. So uh, you have the tangent going from here to here. Now the angle of the tangent can be found out using perpendicular axis here. So uh, what we have learned till now is indications, revise the indications of radiation and breast radiotherapy. Learned the process of positioning in breast radiotherapy, both for chest wall as well as whole breast, and learned how to place and verify the tangential field with a 2D technique. 
so uh, should we should we uh, take some questions before we move on if if somebody is i think i can you move on we'll take questions in the end okay sir okay fine right right so the next point is b modification so now we have placed basic tangential fields uh, then we have to find out if any form of b modifier is to be added in whole breast radiator so the